Flanagan. Flanagan. And we are recording. And I'm waiting for Derek to give me the thumbs up to tell us if we're live. Good. We're good. Great. Thank you, Gary. Uh, good evening and welcome to the regular town council meeting of Weathersfield. Today is January 19th and per the executive order of Governor Lynn Ned Lamont, this is being recorded. Um, let's see, Councilman Pentelow, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, which stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mm. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sue, um, recording of the attendance, please. Okay. Um, Councillor Biggs? Present. Um, Councillor Flanagan? Councillor Forrest? Here. Councillor Hill? Here. Councillor O'Connor? Here. Councilwoman Pelletier? Here. Councillor Pentelow? Here. Uh, Deputy Mayor Mazzarella? Here. And Mayor Rell? Here. Okay. As always, thank you, Sue. Oh, Appreciate welcome. that. Thank you. Um, moving into the agenda, um, item A, one, hearings. We don't have any hearings up for tonight. Um, we will. I, I'll tell you, it's my plan to have the Board of Ed on uh, for our February 1st meeting to get a, um, you know, a jump start on the budget uh, discussions. So um, plan for that. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions or, you know, ideas going forward with the budget, in particular, how it pertains to the actions of the school board, as well as, you know, anything that's going on currently at, uh, at the school, in the school district, um, prepare for uh, February 1st meeting with that. Uh, moving on to item A2, general comments. Uh, Gary, I see some phone, phone numbers on for people calling in tonight, if, uh, if you will. Uh, I think we're going to continue with the five-minute rule. You have five minutes in the uh, beginning, and there is a second public hearing comment section at the end. So um, try your best to keep it to five minutes. Uh, obviously, if you go over a little bit, you won't be penalized, but uh, try and surmise what you have to say and we'll get other people in. And then further on at the end of the meeting, if you have anything to comment on or follow up with, um, please do at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, first number 860-306-9560. Remember to hit star six to unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Robin Barasa. I live at 248 Dale Road, and I am um, calling in support of the letter that the council has drafted in regards to um, car thefts over the past few years and the rise in crime. Um, in 2017, we were one of the 83 that had our car stolen out of our driveway. Um, for full disclosure and transparency, it was an error on my part that has become a running joke in our home. Um, we had a new car that had a push button start. Um, I thought I had grabbed my keys. I had inadvertently, and for the only time in my whole entire life, left the keys in the car, not realizing it. I literally must have handed the car over to the criminals that took it out of our driveway. They found the car two weeks later in Hartford with uh, over $10,000 worth of damage, um, which gratefully insurance did cover. Um, but I, we do know our car was used for other crimes um, across the state because in our car we found pocketbooks and cosmetic bags with um, gift cards and names of people from all different towns all the way up to Danbury. We had several thousand miles put on our car 
in, in addition to the damage. Um, it was upsetting um, at the very least. That seemed to be um, kind of the beginning of what I'm calling a horrible trend going on now with um, cars being stolen, now more so in broad daylight, um, while people are warming their car up in the morning, um, early evening hours, um, and just total recklessness. And I feel, although I don't know, that there was a good possibility that juveniles may have stolen our car. They never caught the perpetrators. Um, but it was really unsettling, and a loss of security has certainly gone deep with us because of what happened to us. And, and I will, you know, admit because of my mistakes. But that being said, clearly uh, car thefts and crime have increased over the past few years. I am in full support, as I stated before, of the town council drafting this letter and sending it to our state legislators uh, in regards to not changing anymore or widening the birth um, to allow juveniles to get away with more of these crimes. Um, it, I think our legislatures have, legislators have to listen to their constituents. Um, I know there's a lot of social causes and feelings behind um, what I'm sure is going to be quite um, a spirited discussion going forward. But that being said, we worked very hard. We worked very hard to purchase our cars, to live in a safe community, in a home, and to have someone come onto our property and steal something is just not okay. Again, we don't know who stole our car. Uh, we don't know who's doing all the stealing. Some of the Criminals are being caught from, some, and most of them are juveniles for obvious reasons. There's no repercussions. So um, I just like to leave um, the conversation uh, again, stating that I appreciate the town council going forward with this. Several towns um, in our neighboring communities have done so, and it is greatly appreciated uh, by myself and the rest of my family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Um, yep. next caller coming in. Next caller, 860-416-2918. And hit star six. Star six to, yep. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great, good evening. Um, this is Cindy Greenblatt calling you from 35 Broad Street. Um, and I tried to communicate with most of you today, and I wanted to read into the record the letter that I sent so that other people watching could be aware, too, of what's going on with the Brainerd Airport um, expansion. So at the, I wanted to reach out to discuss this with you, and I'll read the letter. At the last meeting of the Hartford Brainerd Noise Advisory Committee of 2020, members were told that the first step of the process would be tree cutting and that 2021 was targeted to gain approvals and permits in preparation for tree removals in 2022. I strongly oppose on behalf of the, not only my family, but on behalf of the community, any and all attempts to expand Brainerd Airport to accommodate private and commercial jets to the detriment of our property, our environment, and our economic well-being. I was appointed by former town manager Jeff Bridges to serve on the Brainerd Noise Advisory Committee. And I think it's been almost five years now that I've served on that committee. And I can testify to you all tonight that any voluntary noise compliance requests of pilots is ineffective. I've sat through the meetings for years. Others can attest to that. To witness the incredible revival of Old Weathersfield's Village Business District, the restaurants, the museum expansion, etc., and then realize that tree removal is the first phase of the Connecticut Airport Authority's plans that will end up inundating that district with jet traffic lends a real urgency to this task. All right. In 2017, the mayor, the members of the town council, and all our legislative representatives, as well as dozens of residents, opposed this plan at a public hearing. All the trees under consideration were west of I-91, and they were um, 
covered by a conservation agreement. And we can thank Eleanor Buck Wolf for that agreement. And those trees are owned by the city of Hartford. There was never, and I repeat, never any discussion of cutting trees in the area south of Folly Brook or east of I-91 in Old Weathersfield during those hearings. Attempts to do so now without public knowledge of the plan, the number of trees involved, the method of removal, the environmental impact, et cetera, would constitute a tremendous breach of the public trust. It's not just me saying this. I want to read to you from the plan that the Connecticut Airport Authority submitted to the Federal Aviation Authority on the modified plan that they'd accepted or preferred for the Brainerd um, tree removal. I quote, the south end of the airport, the recommended tree removals terminate at Follybrook with no clearing recommended south or east of Interstate 91 in the town of Wethersfield or in the Wethersfield Cove area. In the letter that I sent to you, I cited the page of the reports that you, the report that you can look at to, to verify that. So I would ask you tonight as our town council and mayor to get together with the Great Meadows Conservation Trust and the city of Hartford and speak with one voice in opposition to these efforts to circumvent the public process in Wethersfield and to pursue this plan, which is wholly dependent upon massive state and federal financing. We need our mayor and our council and our legislative delegation to keep us informed on the process and lead a coordinated response to these proposals. And so that is the letter that I sent to you. And I also want to offer you my help as a historian. I have, I have been in these meetings now for years. I participated in the public hearings that took place in Wethersfield. I've read most of the reports and can direct you to almost all of them. And I would be happy to be part of the process. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Greenblatt. Anybody else? Carrie? 860-563-6923. Good evening. This is Robert Young from 20 Copper Mill Road. Uh, first of all, um, I'd like to say that it's, uh, I've been reading in, on the internet regarding this uh, um, automobiles that have been being uh, stolen and whatnot in our neighborhoods. And, and that's a pretty, you know, Robin, who I don't even know, I know I, I hear her name all the time, but uh, I really sympathize with someone who got their car stolen. And, and, and then you find out that the person that did it gets off, off the hook. And, you know, guys, uh, if, you, if you put out a letter, and I know I saw your letter on, on the agenda, when the time comes and they capture somebody, you can't back off because you might know their folks or because they're part of who knows who or whatever. You have to keep your stand. Um, otherwise, the letter is really worthless. But I, I sympathize with Robin. I sympathize with anybody that loses their car. Uh, they get it back as all damaged and who knows whatever else. Uh, I think that's terrible. Uh, next, uh, I'm glad to hear tonight that you mentioned the word budget. This is the first time I've been hearing, I've heard the word budget for this season. I would have thought you would have been looking at it earlier. But I do hope. I do hope to see our, we get a drastic reduction in our budget. Remember, some of you guys ran on the, on the idea of reducing taxes. And uh, we need to see reductions. We saw only 62000 last year, but I know it was a short situation. You already had somebody else's budget. Now you've got your own budget, and you, and you definitely need to reduce the cost of taxes in this town. It, it's, it's paramount that you reduce. Next, <clears throat> I was gonna mention this at the last town council meeting, but I, didn't, but I ran out of time like always. I have, a, I have uh, submitted a FOI to the town manager back in uh, November 18th, 2020. I waited. And I never, I did not get a response back from him acknowledging my letter to him requesting for information. 
And when I did send him a message back, he did apologize uh, that he missed it. I don't know what he meant by that, but I've been waiting still since then. He, he, I, I wrote my letter and sent it in on November 18th, November 19th. He came back on me. I wrote him a message back, I think, on December 2nd. He came back on December 4th and says, I'm sorry about I missed it. Well, I'm still waiting for it. So uh, I, I don't know what's going on. I, I can't believe uh, that this is anything big or serious. Um I, I, I'm really chomping at the bit to take you guys to the FOI court. But I know that with this virus thing, it's a whole different world up there. It's not like I, we, we're all going to walk up there. It's going to be on television, and it's going to be a little different, and I don't know if I even want to do that. But I am getting pretty ready to file a paper uh, regarding uh, this this FOI, because I have other questions that I want to submit as well, and I don't want to be accused of loading up the manager with three, four, five, six different FOIs, and some of them are going to get lost in in the shuffle, and and I'll be trying to keep track of what's what, and, and what did I get back, and what didn't I get back, and, and then someone will end up saying, oh, you sent too many in at once. I sent one in, and let's go back a year, a year ago. 10 months ago, whatever it was, I put in an FOI, and I ended up waiting eight months, seven months, eight months. And, and that's, you know, FOI has a certain amount of days that the town has to respond by. And I don't know if it's because of the budget, I mean, the uh, coronavirus, that we're not getting, I'm not getting these responses. But it is definitely wrong, and and you guys have a a time limit. If I go forward, it's going to cost the town money. Do I want to see you spend money on more legal fees? Not at all. I just want the information that I'm entitled to receiving. And and when I get it, I should be getting it on, on a promptly, timely basis. So please, respond to me. Let me know where I stand with you, with the question, or it's only a few things I was asking for, um, and, and and I should have had them long ago. Thank you oh. very much, Mayor. Thank you. And actually, in, in council comments or a, a town manager's report, I I'll ask uh, our town manager a status of that, um, and if uh, we have to discuss it further at the end of this meeting, uh, we will. Thank you. Next caller. Yep. Next caller is 860-566-0764. Oh, they just connected. 860-838. One four five three. Council members, good night. This is Paul Brady from sixteen eighteen Church Street. I just wanted to leave a few comments as it regards to the letter that was uh, the letter that's being proposed uh, to be sent to the legislature as it relates to the car break-in. Um, I my my concerns here are I see that the council members are really worried about what's happening as it relates to Jordan court. But um, the question that I have here is, I don't know if any council member has ever met with the people that actually work with child protective services or um, anyone from the, the um, from DCF or anything. Uh, I mean, in, in the pandemic, these things have been going on, not just in our town, but they're everywhere else. Every town, it's all, it's all across the country. Kids have nothing to do. And for some strange reason, a lot of kids get find themselves in mischief. I would just like everyone that's sitting on council to think back when you were 14, 16, or 18 years old. Uh, I, I, while all these break-ins are 
completely inappropriate, they're wrong, and there should be consequences. I don't think that a 16-year-old, a 14-year-old, or an 18-year-old uh, should be, uh, you know, their life should be ruined because they did something stupid. So I, I just want you guys to kind of, you know, probably get a little bit more educated on these issues first before actually look into propose something like you know this this letter it's it, it's the letter doesn't speak well to uh to me as a parent i will say that and um you know i my, my child is not close to the age of 14 or 18 yet but i still worry about my neighbors uh this i think that there are other ways and it has been proven that taking uh other actions to actually mitigate uh, problems that children has had in uh, in in the public uh, when it comes to whether it be theft or certain things, rehabilitation has worked a lot better than throwing them in, you know, throwing them behind bars and putting them in the system. So that that's really what I have for tonight so, uh, as it relates to those letters. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Eight six zero nine four 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 zero seven five. Hi, this is Catherine Scheinberg Meyer. I'm a resident of two seventy nine Fox Hill Road, and I sent an email um, just before three o'clock this afternoon. I wanted to read into the record. Sure, please. Okay. Dear Mayor Rell and members of the Town Council, I am a Weatherfield resident and attorney for children. I'm also a mother of four little girls in town. I am writing today to express my strong disagreement with both the substance and the tone of the letter written by this council to our town delegation. First, I take great issue with the way this council characterizes juveniles who may or may not be involved in car theft in our town. Instead of relying on decades old research on adolescent brain development and Supreme Court decisions going back over 20 years, this council has decided that the many juvenile justice reforms Connecticut has enacted over the past decade are baseless. Instead of examining the biological and sociological reasons why Connecticut and the rest of the country, as well as almost every country in the world, has raised the age of juvenile court jurisdiction to 18, the council is more concerned with the inconvenience it causes to police officers in conducting their investigative procedures. The letter also puts the discretion of juvenile court judges at issue, complaining about the challenge to obtaining a signed court order. Orders are supposed to be hard to obtain and are supposed to involve judicial discretion. And as a matter of public policy, orders to detain should be even harder to obtain during a global pandemic for obvious reasons. It is unclear how the council thinks that the state delegation can do something about that. Instead, it's merely a prejudicial comment tossed into this letter to fit into the narrative bemoaning a soft on crime approach to juvenile justice in our state, which simply isn't true. My office's caseload of incarcerated and reentered youth tells otherwise. I'd love to have one of my clients speak to you directly so you can hear the real experiences of the youth in the system rather than fall prey to fear mongering. Another segment I take issue with based on my 12 years of experience as an attorney for children is the dismissive description of court diversion programs such as the Juvenile Review Board. This description completely undermines the success of these community-based programs to coordinate and connect kids to services. Kids who are truant from school, kids who have run away from home, kids in other precarious situations due to no fault of their own. Instead, would the council prefer these kids fill beds and locked units? Research shows that it's completely ineffective, not to mention absurdly unjust. One item I do agree with is the fact that when CJTS was closed, the state did not reinvest nearly enough resources into community programs that could keep kids safe and at home. I would welcome this group banding together to make that point so that kids could be served, mental health, education, and family support at home, preventing further criminal behavior and incarceration. Instead of lamenting about the layout of detention centers for locking kids up during a pandemic, why don't we discuss how to make our communities more accountable to the children they are supposed to be serving? That's a much more challenging question and it requires us to look inward. Instead, it's easier to vilify kids, especially those who might not live in Weathersfield or look like many members of this council. I'm so disheartened to see the leadership of my town copy and paste talking points from our retired state chief prosecutor, adding anecdotal police gripes 
instead of actually using this opportunity to listen and learn from our residents. This letter is so terribly one-sided and not on the side of kids. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Just making sure that's not a duplicate number. It's zero. Oh, I have one more. Looks like one more. 860-490-4341. If you're looking to speak, uh, please press star six. Again, 860-490-4341. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Deborah Cohen, 73 Church Street. Um, I'm also calling, I'm actually calling about two things, but the first one is my opposition to the letter that you are considering sending to our legislators, at least insofar as it stands now. Um, I'm not going to repeat all of the things that callers before me have said. But there is something that really troubles me about this. Um, do I have your permission, if I do not include the name of the person, to read something that was posted on social media? Is that allowable? I think so. Just no vulgarities. Okay. Please. Okay, uh, I promise. I promise you that. Um, there seems to be an attitude among many Weathersfield residents that all of the things that happen in Weathersfield that are bad are happening and being perpetrated by people from out of town. What I don't understand is if the, if the majority of these folks have not been caught, how do we know who they are? How do we know where they're from? So here's, here's something that illustrates what I'm describing to you. I swear I'll run them over with my car if they come anywhere near my house. I hate these kids. They need to go back to wherever the hell they came from and leave our town alone. What I'm suggesting to you is that perhaps you take another look at your intention, take another look at the letter, and wonder if you might reword it or reconsider it if the assumption was that crime that happens in Weathersfield is perpetrated by Weathersfield residents and youth. The second thing that I would like to register my thought about is um, a matter of transparency, and this is something that I think I bring up to you guys time and time again. And this has to do with the paid administrative leave of our chief of police. I think I have to, I have to um, just take that there may be reasons why you cannot discuss the particulars of why he's on paid admin, uh, administrative leave. At the very least, we should not have learned about this from an article in the paper or a news broadcast and to make matters worse, most of us didn't even know that there was an acting chief in his place at this time. Transparency breeds trust. Trust is an absolute must if we are going to work together. Um, I guess I'll only speak for myself right now, but without trust, there is no collaboration. There is no teaming up. There is no moving forward and working on problems together. I just don't understand why information as basic as, by the way, we have an acting chief right now, wasn't announced to every single resident in town at the time that it happened. Okay, that's, those are my two thoughts for tonight. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Deborah. And that is the last for callers. I don't know if you wanted to do mail at the second public hearing or public um, comment. I'm sorry, what was that Gary? You wanted to? I said that was the last caller. I didn't know if you wanted to do um, any mail that we received at the second, uh, during the second public comment. Yes. Um... Why don't we do that after the uh, second comment? Sue, so, you have those and summarize. We all have, I think everyone has been mailed a copy 
of an email or a letter, if I'm not mistaken. So we do have the, the full letter and the, the full hard copy yes. as yes. well. And I have this and I have the summary. Yeah. And summary. Okay. So and if anybody from the public wants to know, um, you know, what are in those letters, we, we do have them available through the town clerk's office. Okay. Get back to the agenda. Uh, I believe we're now on council reports. Are there any members with council reports? Hearing none and seeing none, I'll move over into council comments. Anybody with any council comments? Councilman Biggs. Uh, good evening, all. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, make just a notice of yesterday being uh, Martin Luther King's uh, birthday celebrated. Um, so <clears throat> just wanted to say a little something that I, I brought up for this. Um, so as we know, yesterday, the third Monday of January, uh, we celebrated Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, whose actual birthday is January 15th. Um, and I just want to say many of us use his quotes or cite his famous, I have a dream speech, um, but many of us do not know um, anything past those words. As a civil rights leader in the 50s and 60s, uh, Mr. King sought equality and human rights for all people of color and advocated for all victims of injustice through peaceful protests. He advocated for equal pay, voting rights, and basic human rights for all. Even in his peaceful protests and actions for civil rights based on doctrine that all men are created equal, he was still considered a threat, a communist, and a terrorist. Because of such malice against Dr. King, he was assassinated. Um, with that being said, I challenge everyone to dig a little deeper into Mr. Dr. King's work um, to further understand race relationships in today's society. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to ask you all to consider involving yourselves in our town's social justice coalition which is attempting to discuss similar topics such as equity diversity race and cultural responsiveness i just wanted to put that on record um, as we celebrated the day yesterday thank you mayor i appreciate that thank you councilman uh councilman forrest thanks mayor uh just as far as uh council comments i'd like to start to work with um this council as I'm going to say oversight, but I use that very lightly to talk to the town manager and our health department about how we are going to start informing uh, residents and encouraging residents to start getting vaccinated and what that process is, how many doses we've got, who qualifies. This is going to be an administrative hurdle, no matter who's president or governor or representative, whatever it is. We really should, I think, start our process about educating our general population as we go through the largest vac vaccination in the history of the human race. Um, I think that starts today. It probably started weeks ago, of course, but we should, as a council, as leadership of this town, be on our A game with this one. So I'm encouraging you, Mike and Gary, council to take whatever action it, it is necessary to start the education process and even if there's allocations of funds for education about how we start rolling this out, identifying letters, of course, it's easy to say Facebook and the rest of it, but that we have a comprehensive plan and then we hold our health department to a comprehensive plan to start to roll out this vaccination and uh, get the information of those who need it. Transparency, which has been discussed by the public, whether they like vaccinations, don't like vaccinations, don't understand what this one is, full transparency and full opportunity to start to get our economic engine going again, our life engines going again, and that we can start to pull out of this. Because if we go an extra month, um, that's gonna hurt that we don't need to because of administration, um, our lack of uh, due diligence for administrating this vaccine, I think that would be a loss to our town. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's a, uh, you know, ever evolving situation. And, you know, it's kind of like watching a bouncing ball or trying to catch a bouncing ball, uh, finding out exactly when in what age group, what, um, you know, uh, professional background. A, there is a committee that has been formed on the um, vaccination committee. And uh, it seems like every day they're changing um, the criteria for who can be uh, vaccinated. But you, you do make a good point and uh, maybe we can get uh, 
um, some folks in from the health district just to talk about um, where they are being uh, administered. Uh, I did receive a couple calls from folks who had questions of their own. Uh, one gentleman and he and his wife are in their 90s but don't live in a nursing home. Um, you know, they at first were not a, um, a population that was being targeted by uh, the state for vaccination, even though they were above, you know, 75 or, or an older, but they were in confined in their own homes, not in nursing homes. So prior to the governor opening it up to those 65 and older and 75 and older, wherever we are right now, um, they weren't included in the nineties. So um, it is ever evolving if we can get our hands around it and get some folks to come in and talk about it, I think, yes, uh, transparency would be good in a, a PSA on behalf of uh, the town to our residents on um, the merits of being vaccinated, where to get vaccinated, who's uh, eligible is, um, is a great idea. Thank and you, Council. Thanks, Mayor. And just to, um, for our consideration for this Council, even if it maybe even needs a Council vote, maybe even to cover Gary, you know, we've got these reverse uh, information systems in terms of in times of emergency. And although this is not one of those exigence emergencies like that happen over the next five minutes, like a tornado, are we at the point where this is a public health emergency that we're willing to use those types of resources with very detailed, if you're 65 and over and you're in Weathersfield, here are the three locations, here's the website you go to. If you don't have a website, right, the phone call, stuff that we're starting to see roll out that we should be using those types of resources. And, it's, I'm not saying I'm not saying yes, we have to, but I think that's a conversation in the very near future we should start having about regular rollouts of that type of information. Mm -hmm. At least we're going in the right direction right now. So thank you. Um, any other council comments at all? Um, I'll just, um, you know, just go off of one or two things um, that uh, I've been hearing about um, just wanted to let you know, staff, uh, our staff is working with DEEP on um, the possible closure of the Mira uh, trash to energy facility up in Hartford. Uh, that is something that is still of concern to us here in town is where we, you know, we have our contract with our uh, trash provider to, uh, to take garbage out of, or out of Weathersfield. Um, if that does close down, what uh, impact is it going to have on our town services and on the cost of um, municipal solid waste? Uh, like I said, we, we do have staff that's been involved in conversations with DEP, uh, looking at other uh, ways to um, you know, get rid of our trash as well as lessen the amount of um, garbage that goes into our um, garbage trucks every, every morning. Um, you know, there's ideas of um, compostable material going separately, um, as well as uh, uh, food scraps and food waste. So a lot of things are on the table right now. Uh, these would all be ways to um, lessen our burden on um, landfills in the future or um, placing uh, items in the trash and energy facility that um, inevitably will be shut down. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to talk briefly this Thursday for those that are available uh, at 8.30. I don't know, Gary, you may know if there's a Zoom link yet for it. Uh, the uh, State of the Town will be held by the Chamber of Commerce Thursday at 8.30. Uh, once we get a Zoom link, I'll ask Gary not only to email it out to the entire council, but to uh, post it on uh, the town website. Um, sorry, we can't do it in person. Last year we did it at um, the Keeney Center. Um, very positive news last year. Nobody had at that point thought about COVID and uh, um, wow, what a difference 12 months has made. So we do, um, we plan to give some updates. Uh, um, Councilman Forrest, uh, your ideas of PSA for vaccine, vaccine rollout um, that's a very good one. We may be able to, you know, include that in there, um, but there's also going to be updates from the Board of Ed, um, Town Planner, and of course, Gary Evans on the, the um, Town Manager. So look forward to uh, seeing folks on that Zoom. Uh, again, once we get the Zoom link, we'll post it for uh, Thursday morning. And that's about it from my end. And Gary? Yep. Uh, let me just bring up 
Thank you, Mayor, and to the Council. Um, as the Mayor said, uh, when that link is available for the State of the Town, I'll make it available. I was on it um, probably about an hour ago. It didn't look like it was updated, um, but I welcome everyone to attend. Uh, the budget season has officially begun, although we started putting parts together uh, end of the year. Uh, this is where we start to ramp up. Um, over the next several months, I'll be meeting with my department heads individually. Uh, they have been working previous to this over the last two or three months, kind of piecing things together and getting pricing uh, for what some of the costs might be for next year. The Capital Improvement Advisory Committee or CIAC will meet for the next four uh, and if necessary, five Wednesdays beginning tomorrow at 5 p.m. Please contact the engineering department for access to the meeting. We are doing those via Zoom um, and making them available, but this is where departments are will begin their request for capital improvement projects for the next year um, and discuss some of their five-year planning and where they are on, on, uh, in the process, um, at which time we'll make a recommendation to the council um, as part of the regular budget process. Um, as I mentioned over the next few months, I'll be meeting with my department heads, although the governor may choose to extend uh, the executive order um, in terms of due dates and when things are done, our timeline, I anticipate sticking to our charter um, related deadlines, which would be delivery of the town manager's budget by the first Monday in April, uh, at which time I will then turn it over to the council so they can review it and make adjustments based off of council priorities. Um, and as usual, like we do every year, this will include the uh, public hearings, budget meetings, and um, making that um, opportunity for council to ask questions to the town manager and to department heads and making it available to the public and to achieve the deadline of the charter deadline of May 15th to have a budget available. Um, this is the first year of the state budget for the biennium budget. And so uh, we're not sure where those numbers will sit, but we'll be staying on top of that to understand where the town of Wethersfield will, um, what level of favor we'll have for the year. As of last week, our COVID numbers hit over 1,700 within town. We actually jumped more than 300 in one week. And the last few weeks, I think we've been averaging somewhere around about 150 people per week. So this is quite a big jump over a seven day period. Um, we see this, it's still a matter of concern. We, and the town continues to encourage residents to maintain social distancing, follow good hygiene practices um, and ensure uh, to, cover their mouth, mouths whenever possible. With that, uh, as of today, COVID-19 has officially and significantly impacted the ability for the Wethersfield Library to deliver services for the foreseeable future. The library has been, library has been beyond fortunate so far during this pandemic, but unfortunately that officially changed uh, over the weekend. The library will remain closed as a result till February 1st. To be clear, the closure is specifically due to the number of staff that need to quarantine as a result of um, contact within the community. And this is very similar to the school situation where there's just simply isn't enough coverage or staffing to maintain operations due to those individuals having to be out for a quarantine period. Uh, it's also important for me to note that the members of the general public who recently visited the library during the past week are not considered close contacts with any of these individuals and should not be concerned. We are taking precautions with staff and we're going to uh, thoroughly clean the building while it's closed. Uh, while some of the staff of the library, <clears throat> excuse me, are quarantining, they are working remotely uh, and we anticipate that we'll be fully reopened. Again, the target is February 1st. Staff are still able to resp respond to reference questions via email, library at weathersfieldlibrary.org. Um, electronic resources, databases, ebooks, audio ebooks, e music, all still available using the website. Hold pickups have been postponed until February 6th, however. And the book drop remains open for returns. Obviously, all fines will be continued to be waived. Weathersfield Parks and Recreation is sponsoring a new program and we welcome and encourage all gamers to come socialize while social distancing. It's called the Weathersfield Remote Esports Club or REC, Weathersfield REC. Uh, this is virtual esports from the comfort of your own home. Put your skills to the test and local online video games. 
um, forming your own league. We challenge residents of all ages to play head-to-head -head competition, enjoy bragging rights, prizes, which are coming soon in games such as Madden 20, Fortnite, Super Smash Brothers, Ultimate, uh, NBA 2K20, Mario Kart 8, and Words with Friends. It's just like all other recreational sports leagues, but for gaming. If you're interested, you can download the app at Parks and Recreation at the Parks and Recreation website or contact them directly for more information. Uh, a few just quick other items, Walker Hill Road reconstruction. There's a virtual public information meeting being held with town staff and VHB who are the designated consultants uh, via Zoom on Thursday, January 21st, beginning at 6.30. Uh, at which time the consultant and the town will present preliminary design plans for the reconstruction of Wolcott Hill Road from Jordan Lane to Victoria Road in Hartford. If you're interested in attending, please email your name, address, and phone number to Derek.Gregor, G-R-E-G-O-R, at weathersfieldct.gov, or you can call the engineering department directly, and you'll be sent a link to join the meeting if you call if you don't have access to email, call 860-721-2850 and they'll provide you access to the information. The deadline to RSVP is noon on January 21st. Um, because it did come up, one of the callers had mentioned this. Um, I wanted to inform the council that the Connecticut Airport Authority will be sending letters to local municipalities surrounding Hartford Brainerd Airport, as well as a limited number of nearby businesses and institutions uh, to propose easements, acquisitions for airspace obstructions, those are the trees, and any other obstructions that might be in the way. The purpose of the letter that's going to come out as we've been informed is to make sure to connect municipalities and businesses with the airport's consultant to coordinate a completion of an easement appraisal to determine the fair market value. I think it's important to note that the project permitting phase is still in process and in progress with DEEP Nothing's been approved yet. Um, I, you know, I anticipate public meetings are gonna take place on the subject. This is not something that's simply gonna be stamped and, and moved forward. Any obstruction removal that is approved will not be expected until 2022. And there's a process that they have to go through. And um, nothing is planned to move forward until that permitting phase concludes. The airport authority does mention in their um, kind of an intro letter to me, that they don't intend on contacting private homeowners, but I will keep the council informed as well as residents informed of any progress um, that's taking place using the town's website, Facebook page, and other media available to us to make sure that we get the message out. And it sounds like there's at least one resident in town from the public comment that will be doing the same and sharing that information. Uh, Social Justice Coalition, uh, we had a meeting in January. There's one scheduled for February 2nd uh, at 5.30. It's scheduled planned 5.30 to 7 p.m. Participants so far have been um, trained on uh, what's called the Community Conversation Compass. Um, and uh, it, really the compass works to help people understand how different events might mentally or physically or emotionally impact decision-making that they make, their, their reaction to it, um, and how their, um, and that compass can be used really to evaluate um, things that have happened in the past and things in the future. And it, it gives participants an idea of where different people may be coming from um, as an event happens um, and why there might be differences of opinions and, and hopefully where we can kind of blend those, the ideals together. Um, we've begun to narrow the focus of topics going forward to around two or three based off of a survey uh, that took place with participants. I would say on average, there's been about 90 participants in um, in these meetings, sometimes more, sometimes less, but I would say the average is about 90. That makes it a little bit challenging to have uh, the dialogue in a way we would prefer to have it. We do break out into groups and we have group leaders um, and then we return with the information. And so I'll be posting that information shortly as we kind of define what those two categories are, but it was um, uh, even eye-opening for me as to kind of the direction the group wanted to go. I'm trying to think. Just as a course of business, um, I wanted to let you know, I didn't put it on the agenda, but I wanted to let the council know that um, among other things, the town's proceeding with mediation and possibly arbitration in um, the Jay Rivera matter. And uh, it's probably appropriate if you would 
like an update regarding the matter prior to going into mediation or arbitration, um, we could add it as an executive session to the agenda to discuss that pending claim. And so, you know, we, we can do it. We can add it whenever you can add it now or you can add it later. Um, but it's something I just want to kind of touch base with the council before I go into a mediation. Okay. Um, do we have town attorney or town council available? Uh, yep, uh, town council can be available. Okay. Um, yeah, it's the, I'll leave it up to the prerogative of the, the, the council, but if we want to go into executive order, we could go into executive order now or wait until the end of the meeting. Um, you know, I, I, I know there was a conflict with our uh, town attorney. So if we have them available now, um, I think, uh, you know, if, if, there's no opposition if we move to executive session. Could we do that now? Are you guys open to doing that now? I'm fine with, if, it, if the attorney is available now, then he should obviously be there. So I would uh, I have no objection to moving into executive session to have that conversation. Okay. All those in favor of moving into executive session signify by saying aye. 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 Just for, Oppose. Just for Oppose yep. Just for a point of order, I don't know if you have to add it to the agenda first. Oh, quite. Well, uh, we actually maybe it's on. It's for eight. Maybe move it. Move. Open the agenda to move executive session to um, right after general comments. Can we do that? Executive session is on the agenda. We just would have to move it. Yeah, you, you can. Somebody wants to make that motion. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. It's moved in. Real quick, Sue, town clerk communications. We've just been um, also answering a lot of calls about the COVID-19 vaccinations, um, trying to give as much information as we can and calling the residents back. And also they are calling us back with information, which is great. It's been a, a great little um, bit of teamwork, anything they can offer us. So I think it is a great idea to have some kind of um, a public awareness on what is going on and also to remind them that even though you know throughout the country it looks like vaccinations are not widely available or they're running out that Connecticut is doing a great job and that um, you know they shouldn't worry that they should still sign up and and get a date to have their vaccinations just so that the state is aware that there are people out there that want it because I think it's deterring some people from signing up. Um, so that's all I have. Okay. Well, thank you, Sue. Um, I, I did see that Gary just got up real quick. Um, so we will. Um, I'm still here. Okay. Just uh, I'm setting it up so we can go into executive session. Now we should be okay. Hold on one moment, please. We're okay, just give me one second just to make sure we get everything turned off correctly. Brave new world this Zoom meeting is.
Sorry, this is a unique time to use Zoom. Um, so what we're going to do is move into an executive session. I'm gonna stop the recording here. Uh, we'll suspend the feed to the live channels as well as to YouTube. Um, I will let you know once we're officially in executive session and to the residents and businesses, um, we will reconvene um, momentarily when we get out of executive session. I'll start the live feed again and uh, invite the public back in. So. Let's, uh, if you can just hold on a few minutes, we'll move into executive session officially. All right, recording is back on. Derek, let us know when we're live. We are live, Mayor. Great. Thank you, Mr. Town Manager. Um, we're back in and for council action. Do I have to vote to get back into a regular council? I don't believe so. We just went out, so. Um, Following the agenda to adjourn. Yeah, so you're okay. Yep. Uh, council action. I believe we have uh, acceptance of resignations uh, from boards and commissions with us tonight. Yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, accept the resignation oh. of James. Can we hold on one moment? Sue's not back on yet. All right. Where are you, Sue? Sue is on her way. For those of you just tuning in, we are just returning from executive session and waiting for the town clerk to log in. And she is back. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, proceed with uh, resignations. Make a motion to accept the resignation of James Pelletier, 61 State Street, from the Human Rights and Relations Commission, effective January 17, 2021. The term was 7 1 19 to 6 30 22. Second. 
Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Moving on to appointments to boards and commissions. I'll make a motion to appoint Thomas W. Fitzpatrick, 40 Whipple, Whipperwill Way, to the uh, town as town treasurer. Term is 119.21 indefinite. Second. Motion has been made and seconded for the appointment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, I don't believe there's approval of any ordinances or resolutions. Unfinished business, no. And moving on to council action item 3A. Uh, this is our letter to the delegation we spoke about uh, last meeting, and um, this pertains to uh, what we've seen recently in the town of Wethersfield as it um, is pertaining to an uptick in criminal activity that we, uh, we have seen not only here in Wethersfield, but throughout uh, the state of Connecticut. And I think uh, one or two callers had mentioned that uh, it's not only just um, you know here in Connecticut, but this is um, unfortunately going on in other states. Um, but as it pertains to uh, the town of Wethersfield, uh, I, I know our delegation is busy back at the legislative office building uh, and state capitol working on not only bills that they uh, they are working on on behalf of uh, their constituents. Um, but overall bills and proposals that they're working on uh, on behalf of the, the state in general. Um, we've asked uh, our delegation, as other towns have throughout Connecticut, to uh, address the situation uh, that we are seeing here. And, um, you know, we're writing, uh, as opposed to a resolution, uh, which a number of towns have done uh, throughout Connecticut, uh, you know, we felt that a letter directly to the legislative delegation um, would be of interest uh, to uh, our town residents um, as they're dealing with the uh, influx of break-ins and um, car thefts, uh, not only those that are occurring here in Wethersfield, but out of, uh, out of town, but are making their way into Connecticut or into Wethersfield. So, um, with that, we, we did write this letter uh, directed to them. Uh, I know many of the legislators have had uh, forums prior to uh, any resolution or letter addressed to them um, to gain some insight into uh, what is going on. Uh, I think I've told uh, everybody on this council before, I did sit in one uh, where we did hear from prosecutors, um, child advocates, uh, members of the judicial, as well as members of the legislature um, who had direct knowledge of, you know, some of the changes that have occurred throughout um, the legislature over the past, you know, decade or so um, that we feel that need to be addressed. Uh, the, there, it's not just limited to these uh, issues that we have mentioned in the letter, but we have, um, you know, the utmost confidence in our legislative delegation that when we start to open up a uh, dialogue with them, uh, that other issues uh, may come about and, you know, some that we might not even be aware of right now. Uh, we're hoping that the, the legislature through their um, research capabilities for past uh, legislation um, and the intended uh, uh, effects of the, that legislation and, you know, the reality of what has occurred. We're hopeful that uh, with their insight and those of their colleagues in the legislature that uh, maybe we can get a better understanding of you know, why the laws were created in the past and uh, what, if any, steps can be taken by the legislature to address you know, some of the shortcomings of those laws. Um, as you guys can see in this um, letter to them, uh, Councilman Forrest had asked for some data in the past 
um, you know, specifically what we have seen here in, in Weathersfield um, as it pertains to either car thefts, um, chases, uh, break-ins, uh, the data is there. Um, in the letter you'll see, you know, chronologically from 2000 uh, back for five years, uh, we, we have seen an uptick in vehicle thefts uh, of about 20 from the prior year to this year or to this most recent year. Um, it is just shy of our, our high in 2017 of 83 vehicle thefts. Um, but one of the um, telling situations and, and one that is, um, you know, unfortunately rearing its ugly head throughout the town and uh, some concerns that I've uh, addressed and seen through um, local media reports is the uh, vehicle break-ins. And, um, you know, the, the high, unfortunately, was in 2019 at 79. Um, that was two more than um, the second high of two, uh, 2017. But in 2020, I mean, it, it, it went from 79 in 2019 to 324 um, vehicle break-ins. Um, there are a number of factors that lead to those break-ins. Uh, we had unfortunately heard the story from one caller earlier that um, she inadvertently left a, a key fob in a, a new car. And I think that technology, you know, it is what it is with uh, the ease of access for the um, um, car owner to have a key fob. Um, and that does lead to, um, you know, more folks leaving their car running to warm it up in the morning on, on cold winter mornings or leaving it running to, um, uh, you know, make a quick errand and uh, stop in and, and get a cup of coffee or, or pick up dry cleaning. And, you know, the, the town uh, as well as other towns have done PSAs. I see them uh, nightly, it's, it's nine o'clock, lock your car. You know, the public is, is well aware of the situation for good or bad. You know, it's either happened to them, it's happened to a neighbor or it hasn't happened to them, um, but they are preparing themselves um, and, and being um, you know, forthright with the, their, their thought to uh, keep valuables out of their car, keep their cars locked. Um, but unfortunately, the, the uptick is not just simple um, break-ins or thefts because of a, a running car or a key fob. Um, they are you know, targeting cars that don't, don't have alarm systems on them uh, and breaking into the glass uh, on the side of the car to be able to, uh, to grab any material that they are any valuables that they see uh, in front of them. Um, this could be from, you know, spare change in the center console to, you know, uh, the latest iPhone or laptop that they, they left in the car. Um, we are going to continue with the PSAs uh, on that. Um, but more importantly, as it pertains to this letter, um, we want to have a conversation. We, you know, we, we don't want to simply, you know, make a resolution and unfortunately have it sit on a shelf and uh, not have anybody take any action. So it's uh, um, my hope and, and hopefully the, you know, the, the wish of the full council to get this into the uh, hands of our delegation, where if they are going to take up any um, law changes or proposed legislation this year to address any of the um, uh, increase in motor vehicle thefts, break-ins, or, um, you know, high-speed, you know, travel through town in stolen vehicles, um, that not only are they going to look at it from the Weathersfield perspective, but more importantly, from the, the community as a whole, um, because I'll go back and, and say that this is not directly related to uh, just Weathersfield uh, when it comes to this. Um, we have, um, you know, talked about youthful offenders uh, and some of the law changes that have occurred in the past uh, with that. Um, there are some other um, issues that have arisen and, uh, you know, the the fact that COVID right now has, um, you know, shut down schools um, permanently, like they did last March, um, with complete out of school uh, learning, to uh, a hybrid appro approach like Weathersfield 
there are days um, that um, you know kids aren't in school, uh, lack of sports and extracurricular activities, and simply just a lack of anything else to to occur in their lives um, is unfortunate. And uh, it's not only you know unfortunate in the fact that uh, they're not getting a proper education and, and properly um, you know act you know participating in activities uh, outside of, of school that uh, unfortunately uh, at idle times um, leads to trouble and uh, we kind of want to you know take a look and, and see what it is exactly during the pandemic that may have led to this. Um, we envision a frank conversation with our legislature, our legislators to you know, discuss this and um, you know, have, a, have that conversation uh, as they may be hearing it from their colleagues uh, on the matters. Um, I will open up to a discussion on the floor uh, for anybody who you know, wants to comment on this, um, we'll take um, consideration of you know any questions or concerns that you have, and, and hopefully you know if we can incorporate some things that we can agree on to incorporate into this letter and make it stronger to uh, to our delegation that that we are serious as a town council that we are hearing these concerns loud and clear from our residents that we want to do something about it. Um, by all means, uh, we're open to strengthening this as much as possible. Councilman Hill. Thanks, Mayor. I appreciate it. Um, first, I want to thank you and, and, and Gary for putting a lot of this data together that we had requested. Um, it is very helpful to kind of get a picture of what's been happening, the trends in town, um, particularly with you know vehicle thefts. Um, it's, it's an easier uh, data set to track break-ins, that, that exponential number uh, is very disturbing. One break-in is too many in our town, but it's just is a fact of life, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of things that you spoke to, Mayor, I, you know, I really agree with. Um, you brought up two things that I think um, really resonate, one being the pandemic. Um, this is linked to a national trend, not just Wethersfield, Hartford County, Connecticut, but it's all over the country. I think it's over 20% is the increase in motor vehicle thefts throughout the country. Um, so it is something each community in the country is dealing with. Uh, and further, you've discussed kind of um, with the pandemic is, is there's lack of diversion programs. There's just not much to do. And it leads to further crimes, especially ones such as vehicle break-ins. Now, some things I wanted to kind of look at though, that I had some questions on is the data and how it correlates to, um, you know, we go through the, the, you know, going right through the, the letter it has the data on vehicle thefts and break-ins, and then immediately goes into, you know, how sometimes legislation has unintended, anticipated consequences. And we start talking about kind of juvenile justice issues uh, and programs. And I just, I don't see, walk me through like the correlation of how those bills that went into effect eight years ago are now increasing thefts from in 2020. I, I just kind of walk me through the rationale of how we're linking the two together. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's just the um, criminal justice reforms for um, juvenile justice from 2008. Um, you know, there are some other changes that have occurred in, on the state level where, and, and most recently with, uh, you know, the closure of courts throughout the summer, early fall, um, slowly they, they did start to um, come back online with the, the um, court, proceedings for, for a lot of these offenses. Um, unfortunately though, that um, a lot of them um, have just, uh, haven't had the, the, the strength of the prosecutors to be able to do anything. Um, but more importantly, the, uh, the strength of the, um, uh, the police officers, um, they could be hesitant 
to, and this is what we're hearing anecdotally from um, officers, not only in Weathersfield, but uh, throughout the, uh, the Hartford area, is that uh, their concern is that they don't have the support from the state, be it judicial or legislative, to um, have any uh, teeth in what they, they do and, and how they um, you know, treat those that have uh, committed a crime, um, not only for youthful offenders, but for, for any offender. Um, a lot of them, uh, knowing that uh, the court system is down or had been down um, throughout 2020, um, simply the, the youthful offenders or, or offenders knew that uh, um, the prosecution would not be as strong given you know what was going on at the time that they had done it. And so I appreciate that. And I guess my issue there is so I, I I can why but why are we looking at these changes when but we're not mentioning one word about the pandemic and that seems because that first of all seems to be the driving force behind all of these. Uh, you know, and, and that is a cascading effect of with this pandemic meant more kids were at home. There's less, there's no after school programs, there's less diversionary programs. Um, so that seems to be the driving force. And so I don't see how a change from eight years ago or 10 years, however long now, because look at the data itself, is our, our rates fluctuate, they go up and down. And then we have a, a jump in 2020, whereas in even statewide, the data says, I'm looking at from OPM, 2005, there was in the state, there was 10,609 uh, motor vehicle thefts. And that drops to a low of 2019 of 5,964. So we've dropped, our motor, motor vehicle thefts have dropped in half in 15 years. Um, so I think as, as we, yes, they're skyrocketing now in 2020. And that's something I think we need to, I would like to address at the state level, uh, especially with our delegation. But I don't think it's, I don't think we should correlate these changes into what, uh, into this letter, into what is clearly to me, it, well, completely related to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And you're right, we, we do include, you know, due to COVID court order temporarily subjected after the fact. Um, so, you know, we do mention COVID in here that, uh, that it has come up, um, you know, a lot of these, and this is what we want to have the, the conversation with the delegation about. I mean, this is just simply providing the delegation, a, you know, a, an ask to sit down and have a, a conversation with us on this. Um, you know, it, it could be that it is, you know, strictly pandemic related and that's what we may be able to find. But if it's not, you know, we want to know if what you're saying, or, you know, the data does back up what, um, what is occurring. So um, if we can have that, um, you know, information, uh, you know, is it simply the, the fact that the pandemic is allowing for more of this to happen? Um, you know, th those are the questions that we're going to want to be asked uh, of our legislators. And, and I appreciate that. And I just, I just think if we're going to have this conversation, I don't like how we're just, we're kind of cherry picking. It just seems as though that if we're cherry picking laws on the books we don't like, that we are correlating to an increase of vehicle thefts and break-ins when I, I just don't think the two go hand in hand. And I don't mean to monopolize the time, so if you could open yep. up to America. No, and, and, I, and we will have that, uh, you know, your point is very well taken. Um, we will have that in our conversation. And I, I hope that everybody on this uh, uh, Zoom tonight will be, you know, part of that conversation with our legislative uh, delegation, delegation. And if it is, you know, truly, you know, what we say is, you know, COVID related, or if it's um, the fact that uh, um, because of past law practice, it's, it's elevated itself because more, more people are availing themselves to the, the um, lack in, in law, 
then maybe it will be, um, you know, correlated. That's that's the question that we should ask of our our, our delegation. Councilman Pentelo. Yeah, Kev, I was just going to kind of comment on what you said, and I definitely would agree that COVID and the pandemic has definitely exacerbated the problem. But this was, and may not have been a growing problem, but it was a, a, a problem nonetheless before the pandemic. Like my parents' cars got hit twice before the pandemic even occurred, right? So it always has been a problem, but I think the, the point of addressing the legislator in terms of the juvenile laws, is I think it's policy that we can point to where it just may not be working, right? So I think that's the conversation, the question that needs to be had. Um, you know, I, I, seeing as my parents got broken into twice, I really got curious as far as what, what, when people kept mentioning these break-ins and the juvenile laws and how they attributed, I got curious. So I went and talked to law enforcement officers, to people who specialize, specialize in juvenile detent, uh, defense work. I, I talked to juvenile prosecutors. I talked to social workers. And what I really surmised was, is that there's very there's strict limitations on what police officers can do if they even catch the kids. Now, like Mike, Mike, uh, Mike mentioned, Mayor Rob mentioned, post standards now, you can't, you can't even chase them, right? Which again, we could have a, a similar, you know, argument to that. But the point I'm making is that when you, when you, when you have a growing problem, and there's virtually no consequences for the actions of the kids, even if they are caught, I mean, you know, again, I, I say that I've said this before, I'll say it again, I don't think that kids are intentionally gaming the system, so to speak, but I think you can make an argument that a kid with, with, with uh, who, who knows what they're doing, who knows how to manip manipulate the system, the system can be manipulated the way it's written. So I think I would agree with some of the points being raised in the letter to the legislator, whereas we just want to have a conversation and understand, you know, if, if understand if if these can be looked at they can be changed you know and i think that i think that moving forward you're right i think we we need to um, have things like statistics guide our decisions but at the same time when you're anecdotally hearing uh you know complaint after complaint i mean at some point you almost just have to you know you have to ask the question is are these laws are these reforms actually doing what they were intended to do yeah, if I've been there, I, um, I appreciate that. I, um, you know, I go back to, you know, like I said, one, one theft is too many. Um, and, but what I'm trying to do is just guide in anecdotal information, especially in our community, is always good to have because you trust the source completely because it's your parents, it's your friend, it's whatever. Um, but you know, I think I, th I think I look at the data, and it just it just is striking to me. I mean, literally in the last fifteen years, our motor vehicle thefts in the state have been cut in half. It's went from a high to ten thousand to a low of five thousand. Um, and then you look at the the the, the data that uh, the town manager provided, the break-ins, um, you know, they fluctuated, and then they really skyrocketed in twenty twenty. Our vehicle thefts have fluctuated. So I mean. The data itself kind of, to me, tells the story. Once I'm trying to remove the anecdotal information as much as I can, just because it brings some emotion into it. Um, so I, I really, I, I, and I think, like I said, a letter is, is more than appropriate because, you know, we have an issue in town that needs to be addressed. However, I don't want to, I don't think it's appropriate to point fingers at these laws. I, they, I'm sure they are a contributing factor. Some of, you know what I mean? I, I don't want to dismiss that, but the fact that we're cherry picking certain ones and really dismissing others, I would, if we're gonna, my, my argument is that if we're gonna write a letter just to say, we have an issue in town, this is the data, we'd like to have an open conversation and address it, as opposed to saying, we think it might be this, because we don't know, there's no, you know, I, I think we're going in there with a preconceived notion that this, this is the issue and we have no idea. Gentlemen, I, um, uh, uh, Pat, I, I agree with you. Um, it is an issue. Like I, I said in our last meeting, uh, both my wife and my truck were, were broken into five years ago when we moved in town. So yes, by all means, I don't like it. The invasion of privacy, horrible. Um, we have met, may have been at fault by leaving our, car, our, 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 our doors unlocked. 
Um, but at the same time, um, I don't think the, I think the tone of the letter, by all means, yes, I want to have an open conversation with the delegation and say, hey, what is the issue and how do we tackle it? What, what is consistent across the board and how do we actually fix it? Um, we don't really have evidence saying that these are absolutely all youth offenders. I know you didn't say that all of them, you said some of them, but even then we don't have evidence on who the offenders are because we don't, who, who has, how many of these offenders out of the 324 listed for the break-ins, how many of them have been caught to say that majority are this or majority are that? We don't have that evidence. So when we submit a letter like this, um, I, I feel like, we need to have that kind of evidence to say, hey, we know for sure that this is what's taking place in our town and these are the absolute offenders. These laws attach to that, but we can't say that because these laws that we cited inside the letter are specifically for youthful offenders. So how can we submit a letter with a lot of substance against youthful offenders, but we don't have evidence saying that it is youthful offenders? Well, again, did not, I don't want to have this sort of back and forth discussion. I mean, this should be a discussion, not an argument, right? But oh, definitely, if, definitely. Yeah, but if you talk to law enforcement officers, the majority of the people that are caught doing these, these things when they catch them happen to be juvenile offenders. Okay. So that's where, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that 100% of the cases are, are committed by uh, juveniles, you know, juvenile offenders, absolutely not. But what I am saying is, is that when you have somebody tell you that most of the time when these people are caught, they happen to be juveniles, I take that seriously. Okay. So then my further question is, when we talk about tightening up the laws, I guess when we say we're going to tighten them up and whatnot, that means that we, and this is, this is for the whole council, not just for you, Pat. Um, when we tighten up the laws, are we looking are, are we saying that we need to arrest these youthful offenders that we need to, because the evidence shows from the professionals in these areas that more arrest does not help deter the actions. If anything, it, it, it recycles these offenders back into the system and they continue to do these things. Rehab and these, the programs that we've defunded and have minimized help them a lot more. I am, I am a product of DCF. I went through DCF for most of my life. I had a mentor that kept me on a straight and narrow path and here I am today. So I, I think that we need not look at tightening up that grip on, on our youth, but we need to find other methods as far as mentorship programs and community stimulation. And, and like you said, COVID is here. So a lot of these programs are shut down. They're not doing the active programs to keep them, keep them engaged. I just think that this letter sort of has a tone that we rather lock the youth up rather than lock our vehicles. It, it's just, it just gives that tone. I, I, and again, I, that's where I'll, I'll sort of disagree. And I, I, again, man, I would agree with you that we need more programs, but at the same time, you know, and I would also agree that one kid, Kevin, to your point, you know, just like you said, one theft is too many, one kid falling prey to the justice system because he made one mistake is too many in my opinion and my solution isn't to lock these kids up you know if they are they happen to be kids but the point being is that while programs and stuff definitely work like you just said statistically they work they, you, they've seen effective rate there still has to be a consequence for kids who are doing this over and over and over again i mean there's i mean life has consequences right I mean, we have to we have to set a tone even. And again, this is this is the point of the letter. I think it's to have a dialogue with the leg, uh, the state legislators that basically say, hey, look. Consequences need to be set, but we also know that there there are other ways that we could actually do, uh, you know, juvenile justice reform or even, um, you know, program new programs that these kids could do. So I would agree with you. But at the same time, there needs to be consequences for these because they keep happening more and more. So my question to everyone then would be, um, from my experience, sometimes when you say too much, you, you can kind of hurt yourself. So as far as the letter, could it be possible that maybe we're putting too much in the letter to try to get our point across when we really just have to be simple and say, hey, we have this issue across Connecticut and Weathersford, we would like to have this discussion with you to find a resolve. And we don't have to put so much of the 
you know, it's this law, it's that law, it's, it's this that we need to change and whatnot, because I feel like now we're throwing out stuff. And if we don't have a true correlation, it kind of makes us as a council look like we don't know what we're talking about. Councilman O'Connor. Yeah, I, uh, for, I, I was gonna, there's two comments I wanna make. The first is I just wanna um, correct the comment and it's not correct, it's not even the right word. Um, Ryan, you made a comment that um, you were at fault for leaving your car doors open. And I just have to tell you, you are not at fault for leaving your car doors open any more than Mrs. Barassi was for leaving her fob you know, we should have the right to know that my driveway is a safe place, whether my doors are open or not. And it just seems like as a society, we accepted the fact that it's my fault because I left my car doors open. No, I don't, I don't buy into that. I can be maybe more responsible and lock it, but it would be nice if we didn't accept the fact that we have to do that and then work from that premise. So, and that's why I just wanted to disagree with you on that because I don't think that was your fault. Um, but I would tell you the way I have viewed this letter is one, it's sad we even have to write that. Our legislators are the ones who should be addressing this, not us. But town after town after town has had to remind them that what is in place isn't working. And so clearly there needs to be a conversation. But you know what, they're elected officials too and they should be listening to their constituents and they should be looking at this data and saying, hey, there is something going on. And, and I absolutely agree with Councilor Hill that, you know, the correlation, I mean, look at the vehicle break-ins, the number, clearly there's a COVID factor being played out there. So, I mean, to me, is it's, it, that's not rocket science, that's pretty obvious, but it doesn't negate the fact that there are other pieces of the legislation, the laws that are in place that aren't really helping. And I don't think they're doing any justice to the citizens and they're clearly not doing justice to the juveniles that are getting sucked up into them. Is imprisonment and arrest the only answer? Absolutely not. But that's what the legislators got to figure out. We don't write the law or create the law. They're the ones who should be held accountable. They're the ones we should be having this debate with. The fact that, and I'll go back, the fact that we even have to write this letter, I, I personally believe is shame on them. They should have done this a long time ago and fixed this and made it right. You know, otherwise every town in the state of Connecticut wouldn't be writing this. So that's my 10 cents. Councilman Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Let me start off with, um, just to get to this point, there's been a couple of drafts. Republicans, Democrats have been working together. We came up with some changes. They've gone back and forth. So we've had a really great start. Um, and, I, and honestly, like I look around this and I'm not sure from a political standpoint whether you know, we're really apart virtually at all. Um, and in fact, I think Mayor, the way you started, I think Pat chimed in with some really thoughtful comments. And it was, we've got a, we've got a serious issue here. We wanna take a serious look at this. We are bringing it to the attention and we can probably maybe share some of Dan, Dan, Dan's frustration with our, with our delegation. And, and like, it would be nice if we had sort of attacked this a little bit earlier. But I think the reality is, is that I think we're all, I think we're kind of all right. There should be accountability for serious offenses, especially when it's a high risk situation. Um, there's not a correlation necessar necessarily between the two, but but we are hearing anecdotally that, hey, maybe we should take a look at this, fair. Um, and, uh, and that there's a lot of other steps that we can take, maybe things that we've defunded, maybe other actions where people that are in this field much more than I think a lot of us around this particular Brady Bunch picture that we're looking at, have taken a look at and say, hey, you know, we can, it's a multi-pronged approach to a serious problem. And some of that includes a relook at it, maybe some of these juvenile justice laws. Fair, fair. Now this letter, and some of it I worked on, and a lot of the cross-party discussions were accepted and it was great. This letter in its current form is very heavy-handed if you read it, we've talked to other people and say, look, you know, it's very heavy handed as it relates to the criminal justice portion of it. If you look at sort of like percentage, it's like, you know, 60, 70% criminal justice. There's a lot of sentences that are sort of tying the two together, if not inferring, if not actually saying it. And some of it may be true. 
But there's a realization, I think, that we heard from the public, from people that are involved in this much more that on a regular basis, it's their job. There's a lot of other factors going on here. And there's a lot of other studies. So I want to support this. It's a serious problem. We have to tackle it. It's not, and I agree with Dan O'Connor, I think victim blaming, I see it in court. It's, it is the worst type of justice and it puts victims in a very difficult position. And it's not right. Um, but that said, we can do a little bit better. If we're going to say this is an official statement, we're going to put nine signatures on the bottom because we really believe in it. We can do better with this letter. And you know, Mayor, we've been working quickly. I don't think it's something that's just like an intentional delay for any procedural standpoint, but I'd like to take another crack at it. So we say, I think what we're all saying, which is we recognize, there's multi we recognize this is a serious issue. Here's some data that we have from Weathersfield. And here are some of the issues anecdotally that we're hearing. And we're also hearing from our uh, you know, professionals that are in this field. Here are some of the issues that we're seeing that could be a factor. We want to talk to you about it. This letter in its current form identifies some of the issues. I'd like to see the data go back a little bit further than 2016, because I think it's true that even though obviously there's a huge spike in 2020, we were talking about this issue three, four, five years ago as I was really seeing this, this big uptick. So it's not just COVID is certainly taking it to another level, but it certainly was an ongoing issue prior to, prior to early 2020. Um, and maybe some of it has to do with some of the things in this letter, but the way it's worded um, and especially recognizing how we're taking a, uh, an approach to criminal justice, which is possibly a little bit different than we've done for a lot of years, and also recognizing through a lot of good investigation about how and what the correlations are between the two. I think that we can do a little bit better. I think we can be a little bit more balanced. I think that we can actually say, we wanna have a conversation with you. We recognize that there are multiple, there's a multiple prong problem and we wanna have a multiple prong solution to it. Let's take a relook at all the stuff that we've done so we can solve this problem together. That's not quite this letter. This is identifying some, and not really much of the others. And it's not really a balanced approach that I think we all agree upon. So I would ask that if it's possible, and of course, um, I, I think that we've had some good faith working with everybody around here, that we take another crack at this to recognize exactly what everyone is saying around this dais um, and getting it into that form instead of a heavy handed we think we've got, it's mostly criminal justice and, uh, or, you know, these types of changes, it may be some of it, but I don't think we're quite there yet. So I'd like to take another shot at it. I'm happy to be diligent about getting this up there because it's such a serious issue. And we continue to sort of, I don't know if the right term, but use the type of language that we've all been using around here right now and get this into a form which is a little bit more balanced and recognizes the issue when they ask for the conversation. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do it. I'll do even a special meeting if you need to. We'll kick it around a little bit. We'll take some of the ideas that we heard from the public, uh, which we think are good, should be put in here. And also, um, that's what I got. I, I appreciate that, Matt. And I, I appreciate the comments of, uh, of everybody. Um, it is a, uh, it, you know, for some, it's a dire situation. You, you just don't know what might be happening, you know, later tonight, tomorrow morning. Um, with that said, you know, I, I would like to go to our legislative delegation with a lot of the concerns that were brought up tonight. Um, you know, it, it is, it, you know, it, it's not our job to, to list every, every law that's out there that, that is either working or not working. Um, you know, that's the, the role of the legislature to look at and hear from the public, you know, through public testimony, uh, on uh, you know certain aspects there could be things that we're not even looking at uh like you've said um you know as we um go forward with this uh i think we got to have that conversation with our legislative delegation um have them you know hear from them their input in it you know what are they hearing what 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 transpired in 2012 to uh, to have changed the law um, you know, what has worked, what hasn't worked. Um, but I think this letter in its form is, a, is a, an appropriate way to, to get to the legislative uh, legislators to, um, to hear from us and start that conversation. 
Um, you know, I, I don't think it's heavy handed um, in a sense that, you know, we're just focusing on uh, one group of individuals. Um, you know, we have heard from officers that, um, and not only just in Weathersfield, but around us that, uh, you know, the most, the majority of them are our youthful offenders. So that is just going to be one of the, the conversations that we have to um, um, have with our, our legislators. Um, but, but this is just the beginning of a, a open dialogue with them to hopefully get to, uh, to the crux of it. And, um, you know, not only with the, you know, hopefully COVID going down, but, um, you know, people not set in their ways that this is an easy way to, uh, to target folks and, uh, and gain property or gain vehicles. Um, Mike, Mike, we can, I mean, we could call up our legislators right now and start talking about this, like tomorrow, if it was that, I mean, we obviously, we know, we know the people that represent us, right? Um, this is more of a formalized statement, right? It's on our letterhead. Hopefully we're looking for all nine signatures. And I think that we can get there. Um, if you want to get it through, you got, you know, I'm sure, you know, you got enough votes, you can do it, There's nothing we can do. But if we really want to have all of us behind it, we recognize that we work together. And I'm not talking about a long time here. If, we, if you can give us seven, eight, nine days, I think we can get there to a more balanced letter that uh, appreciates some of the other uh, ac the, the other aspects of, of what we've all, what Republicans and Democrats have talked about. Um, and by doing the letter, this is like a formalized thing, right? Like this is like what we believe in as a town versus we'll call up John Funpera, we'll call up Amy Bello, we'll get down here tomorrow. We got to talk about these problems. Well, well, that can happen, of course. This is sort of more of a formalized conversation. So, I think Weathersfield can do a little bit better. And I think it's just because we've got to work on it a little more. I'm hopeful that that, that will be convincing to the council that we could put a, a little bit of a hold, work a little bit together, continue to do exactly what we've been doing for the last 10 days or so. Uh, this issue has been going on for four years, so, or more. Uh, 10 days, uh, another 10 days is not, it will make us look better as a town, I think. Hopefully you agree. And, uh, and then it will, uh, it will allow us to move forward with even more credibility because we're keeping an open mind, but we're attacking a serious issue. Uh, Councilwoman Pelletier. Um, so I just wanted to respond to some of the conversation here. I, I don't think we need any more data, but it seems like the sticking point, the main sticking point that um, some people have is the list of laws that are described because it seems to imply even though we, the letter doesn't state but it does imply that we have a problem with e all these laws or that we are and i think some of the comments we received seem to read it as if we're suggesting or recommending that they reverse all these laws and that's not what the letter says it's sort of just the way i read it was it's just a you know, it, it's just, these are all things to think about, right? But if that is a sticking point is the actual sort of description of all these laws, as opposed to, um, you know, in the paragraph, like before stating all of it, it sort of just summarizes like, you know, the, the fact that um, the threat of punishment has been removed from juvenile offenders and, um, that that's likely a, a contributing factor to the increase in the um, thefts and break-ins. So, but it, you know, so we, we do mention that in the letter and is that, I mean, if, because I, I don't like the idea of drawing out this process and, and waiting a week or two weeks to get this done. I know a lot of towns have already submitted similar letters or past resolutions um, in this regard. So like if we can get this done tonight where everyone is on board, I mean, if just taking out that list of the, the laws, would that like be sufficient or is there more changes, you know, like, because that changes the tone of it. I think that's the idea. I think what um, Councillor Biggs and Hill were saying in particular, like it just, it, the tone, it just sounds like heavy handed and we're, we want to, you know, all these reforms that have passed, let's just scrap them all and, you know, and then things will be better. And that's not what 
our intention of the letter is we want to have a conversation. That's the point of the letter. And we want to explore all the avenues, including some of the juvenile justice reforms. But all of us would agree that many of the reforms that have passed were beneficial and we would support some of them. And, you know, we're, I certainly wouldn't want to reverse all of them that are listed, but these are just sort of you know, things we threw out there, but but maybe they don't need to be included in the letter. So I don't know if could be, because you know, you could always, if we could just amend it here and that would be, I think, and get it done. If we could get everyone to support it, I think that, I mean, that would be ideal. I don't know how, you know, everyone feels about that. Mary, I, I think generally you're on the right path. Oh, sorry, Kevin, I see what you're Generally, you're on the right path. I, I think that they should be still noted. There's there's a lot of anecdotal data, as Patrick, uh, Councilor Pendelo said. You could say, hey, we're, we're hearing from the police chiefs and the police policemen and women that these are some issues. Here's some issues that we've heard from our Weathersfield police. And then you can probably include a few more other things. But I don't think you're going to be able to solve it at 945 at night with this group. I think you have to sit down, do some actual thinking. Maybe it takes an hour to re redraft and kick it back and forth. I, I'd love to be able to do it, but to be thoughtful about it with something that's pretty serious, it's going to be a town document, probably have to sit down and think about it a little bit. But I hear you. On a technicality, you know, maybe it'll change a number here and over there, but it's a little bit, a little bit more of a lift, I think. Happy to work with you to do it though. Councilman Hill. Thanks, Mary. And I do agree with you, Mary. I appreciate that. I um, That is the kind of the sentiment, at least for me, I don't want to speak for Councillor Biggs or Councillor Forrest, but that, you know, kind of picking these certain um, laws to address kind of undermines any other issue uh, that could exist. I mean, I've, and, and we've talked a lot about kind of what police officers in town or throughout the state would say, um, uh, you know, I think if you asked any police officer if they had a magic wand in order to reduce the amount of motor vehicle thefts and break-ins, they would say, you know, bring your keys inside and lock your car and let's end the pandemic. And then we'd probably have, you know, 90% of these cars would not be broken into. Uh, but instead we're kind of addressing these other issues. Again, that may be a contributing factor. We just don't know. So until we can kind of just have a, it's a letter that basically says that we have an issue, we'd like to discuss it with you and not really to get into any of what the possible scenarios are because we simply don't know. I mean, that's at least where I'm coming from. Yeah, Councilor Pelletz here. Um, thank you for saying that. Uh, yes, I, and I'm sorry if I messed up your name just now, but um, I, yes, in general sense, Yes, I, I like. I, I still believe that when you try to throw too much out there, you won't get anything back. I, I, I agree with that. Um, my concern is, as you said, that the it's implied. Um, I mean, immediately after it says the Weathersfield Town Council is concerned that the above changes have unintentionally. So you know, it although it may be implied, it basically says right after that these are the changes that we believe have caused this. Um, so yes, I, I think like Matt said, um, with that being removed, yes, it would make it better. But going forward, I mean, I want to work together with everybody on town council to submit a, you know, substantial letter that actually has some meat to it that can say, you know what, we need to listen to them. They know what they're talking about. They sent us something that has all the stuff that we need to get things moving and sit at the table with them. Um, so I agree with you. Yes, if we remove some stuff, I'd be more inclined to um, move forward, but I think um, we should, I mean, give it what, a, another week, and I think between the nine of us, we have experience and intelligence where we could create something very um, good to submit forward. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, motion is on the um, well, actually the letters for introduction. Uh, I'll make a motion to submit the letter as is to the state delegation. Second. All those in 
favor? Oh, Councilman Ford. I'll make a motion to table for no more than seven days so that we might be able to draft a better letter, letter in accordance with the comments made here today by council and the public. Second. Okay. Motion to table uh, is on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Aye. Nay. nay. I believe five, three. Did I see the hands up on eyes? Five, three, uh, failed to make the motion to table. So the underlying motion to submit the letter to the legislature, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor of say, uh, uh, sending the letter, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 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 Okay. Motion been made and approved. Five three. Do you got that? Okay. Thank you. Continuing down on the agenda, we do have a. Mayor, can I just ask a quick question? Sure. Um, before we just move forward we're regarding I, mean, I hate to blame it regard, regarding the letter um for the folks that are not supportive of it do will our signatures be included on it uh, if you want them off we can take them off uh it's I your would like mine off. okay thank you and for the other two uh councilman Forrest or councilman biggs same same same, same. okay yes, mayor. thank you Noted, Gary, you've got that? Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for bringing that up. Um, and then again, in other business, we do have some town property, parcel 272007 off of Middletown Avenue. This has come to our attention. Um, count, uh, Mr. Town Manager, do you have any information on this? Uh, sure, just quickly, uh, as it says in the agenda form, uh, this is a parcel that is landlocked. Uh, there's deed restrictions associated with it. There's no access points unless you were in a butter. Um, it was a parcel that the city received in 1973 from the state of Connecticut. Um, the only real access point other than a butters would be through a highway and climb into a highway. So uh, with no access per the deed restriction, the fact that the deed also so requires it to be left as open space, which would include, could include farming. Um, and the fact that um, it is 90% wetlands and 10% floodplain um, means that 100% of it is unusable or unbuildable anyway. Uh, so ultimately we have this parcel that's uh, multiple acres that has no value to the town in its present condition. Um, and so what uh, we're looking for here is the opportunity to first get council permission to use the RFP process versus the resolution process. And then secondly, to put that parcel out through an RFP process for sale um, uh, for any interested party. And the, just so you're aware, the RFP process is specifically laid out under ordinance 37-5. Um, which would require two thirds vote of the council to allow me to create a request for, sorry, request for proposals RFP um, and make that available versus going through a resolution. Okay. Does anybody have any questions of the town manager on this item? Very quickly, um, why is it labeled the police interagency agreement? Is that just oh, the come type on. of? I'm guessing it is. Yeah, where are you seeing? Um, At the top of the document. 3B, under that item. Oh, council, town council item, or agenda item, please. Oh, I apologize for that Scribner's error. There is a blank form that's been saved and reused over Got and over it. again, and sometimes we miss it. I, I thought that's what it might be. I just didn't want to make sure there's not something else underlying the transfer of the property. I didn't think nope. it was. 
so I just for a note to correct that obviously on the record that it, this is for the disposition of town property parcel ID and that I'll amend that officially. Or there's Thanks. a secret hut on this property that's ready to go. <laughs> We're gonna move the police station into the wetlands. That was the, right. <laughs> not just the police station for Weathersfield, but also Rocky Hills, it's interagency. Gotcha. Thank you for noting that Councilman Forrest. Uh, any other questions for this particular parcel? Gary, does this have to go before any other uh, commissions, boards or commissions for our town? Uh, eventually, yes. So the way the, the process that would be um, laid out is that if you approve this by two thirds vote, I would then create a request for proposal that I would put out based off of our um, ordinance and charter requirements um, that would put it out. We'd, I'd get the responses back, I'd organize them um, and then we'd go back to council to, you can accept multiple offers or a single offer. Um, and based off of that, um, you would then, I, on the agenda form, I would look for you to authorize me to negotiate with the, uh, you know, your selected purchaser and probably have some language that says pending um, uh, approval from appropriate town commission. So this would probably have to go to an 824 review through planning and zoning. Um, and off the top of my head, I'm not sure what else, but but definitely an 824 review through PNZ. And you can condition it um, at that time uh, when I come back to you for, uh, uh, you know, approval based off of the following commissions uh, approving. Okay. Any Anybody else with any questions for this? Councilman Forrest. Hey Gary, does um, Conservation Commission usually weigh in on property that's either being bought or disposed of, especially open space? Is there a thought process there? I will look into that. I know in terms of open space planning and zoning would have to, or actually would it be Conservation Commission? One would have had, one of those two would have to review it based off of um, an open space calculation or formula or ensure that we meet the open space requirements that are set in place for us. So you may be right, it could be Conservation Commission. For some reason, PNZ is jumping into my head as part of the POC, Planning of Conservation and Development, um, being part of it. So I would go through and make sure it hits all the correct commissions. So I think that, yeah, and I don't know if it's, I think there's some that are required and some that are more than courtesy. The council usually looks for recommendations of the disposal or acquisition of property, especially as it relates to open space. So um, I think that's part of their charge. So I would recommend um, that we at least pacify them for um, comment, I think is a good term. Uh, perhaps, Mayor, you could do that without objection. Mm -hmm. Is it, does, is that only for open space? Councilman Forrest? Um, it, it's not necessarily for it. Like they, they would comment on the open space that's left in the town, right? And okay. they've got a, they have a list of what is what do they think should be conserved, uh, con, uh, conserved or not. And they have sort of the, they have a criteria that they go through, which sort of identifies those that are good, those that are bad. Can it be developed? Can it not be developed? Do we need to have it? Do we not need to have, you know, all that sort of process. And it is their charge to, advise the council for these types of things. Yeah, I, I think the plan would be for me to refer it and condition it upon, you know, appropriate review. Again, I don't, I don't think they have a, a legal leg to stand to say like, you know, under maybe a planning and zoning to say like, oh, you can't do it. It's, it's advisory, but it's set up there specifically for this purpose. Um, mm -hmm. Like it should be the appropriate, not necessarily a step, but you just receive comment and um, and then, of course, when it comes down to we get the RFPs, we'll have the comment to them and we'll be able to make a decision about whether or not we want to sell it. Okay. Um, so I don't know if we need to include oh, Deputy Mayor Mazzarella. Yeah, I just wanted to bring everybody's attention to the fact that it, it can only, uh, it has to remain as open space. So it would be 
privately owned open space versus town owned open space. The deed is very restrictive. Nothing can ever be built there. And uh, it's kind of a unique parcel that the town acquired as a result of I-91 being constructed. And uh, we have no legal way to get onto the property. So it's not like we can use it as open space for town residents to enjoy. We can't even access the property. So I'm not sure how the conservation commission works, but I would think it's, you know, it's gonna be open space forever. So I wouldn't think they would have an objection. They may not, or they may provide some counsel to say, watch out for this or watch out for that. Or we have grand plans for it. I don't think any of that's true. <laughs> okay. But they, uh, you know, they look at this stuff, they record it. They know about easements. Maybe they'll take a look at the easement and say, watch out for this. You know, there's all kinds of sort of technicality. Yeah, sure. Not only that, you have a commission and they have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And it's specifically to advise for this. And it would be, it, it would be appropriate. And sure, yeah. Okay. Duly noted. And, uh, you know, when we, uh, if we uh, do vote this out, uh, we'll make sure that it goes through not only uh, uh, Conservation Commission, but any um, planning and zoning that needs to, uh, to uh, look into it as well. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion on this particular item? I'll make a motion to authorize the town manager to issue an RFP for the disposition of town property, parcel ID 272007. Second. A motion made by Mazzarella, seconded by Biggs. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Continuing down, I don't believe we have any uh, bids, ordinances, or resolutions for introduction right now. Uh, if you guys all want to take a minute to take a look at the minutes for the January 4th meeting, um, please do so. If anybody's got any comments or questions about those minutes, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> And then if I can get a motion to approve the minutes of January 4th, 2021. So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded on the approval of minutes. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it, thank you. Um, Gary, you've got control of the Circuit board, uh, anybody online? We've officially lost everyone. Um, nope, uh, I saw Mr. Young had signed on earlier and he's no longer on. I do think we have um, a list of uh, written comments, yep. but there's no one for a phone call. Okay, thank you. Sue. Okay. Um, Maria C. Alfonso, 256 Brimfield Road. Ms. Alfonso opposes the proposed changes to the current laws mentioned in the above letter. Um, Elizabeth Riley, 12 Hubbard Place. Ms. Riley states she disagrees with the letter but acknowledges that this is a problem and is a concern for our town. She feels we should look hard at the data at what works in curbing these car break-ins she does not feel that this letter represents her feelings or values. Janice DeRoberts, 87 Meadowgate. Ms. DeRoberts does not agree with the letter concerning car break-ins and youthful offenders and that the opinions and assumptions expressed in this letter are not representative of her. Uh, Ms. DeRoberts states that increasing the severity of consequences is not effective as a deterrent. Gail Spader, 388 Church Street. Ms. Spader recognized the need to address this issue that is affecting the entire nation, not just our town, but feels we shouldn't be targeting juveniles. Ms. Spader states that studies suggest jail does, 
doesn't stop people from committing future crimes and that the state hasn't provided the necessary funding or resources to support disenfranchised youth. Ms. Spader states that if you want change, you have to demand more thoughtful and researched support from the state. Jessica K. Martin, 431 Church Street. Ms. Martin says she is disappointed with the letter being sent to the state delegation and is a resident who has had her car broken into multiple times. She states that increased punishment is not the answer as it only contributes to the erosion of the opportunities that lie ahead. Ms. Martin comments that treating these children like adults will ruin the rest of their lives and this letter does not represent her. Todd Willard, Associate Pastor of the First Church of Christ. Pastor Willard writes because like the council, he cares about the well-being of the community and is particularly concerned about the well-being of young people in our town and surrounding communities. He recognizes the concern of members in our community and law enforcement officers in the light of recent policy changes. He also suggests that council should pursue opportunities for the restoration of those who have made poor decisions and caused harms to others, but is concerned over any policy that might lead to a juvenile being incarcerated alongside adults. He asks that we not be reactionary and consider the complexity of the underlying issues behind the chart in the letter. He appreciates the hard work council does to listen to the concerns of our community and hopes that council will take the time to listen to knowledgeable people in the field. Uh, Jennifer Reagan Lefebvre of 89 Garden Street is against the letter and urges council to vote against this motion. She states this may be one of the most widely studied areas of juvenile justice and that Sarah Egan, the state's child advocate, noted in a recent discussion hosted by Representative Gary Turco that Connecticut still incarcerates minors, even though we know that this doesn't work. She explained that mentoring programs that engage with these minors does work and she needs volunteers. And that's, that's all I have. Thank you, Sue. And again, I'll reiterate those have all, all letters have been emailed to council, uh, those that have come in. Yes, and they will be, um, all the letters will be included in the minutes. Okay, thank you. And no public comment, so no executive session. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second, motion to adjourn, second. All those in favor, signal. Aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nice hat. Motion uh, meetings adjourned. All Thank right. You. Good night, everyone. Good evening. Good Thank night. you. Good night, everyone.